Being from Switzerland, I have to bring some Swiss chocolate, so I pass it on to you. Enjoy it. But you know, um, use it wisely. Um, maybe, um, maybe you have seen recently this sort of charts that have been around. That's an interesting sort of survey that has been done by Mr. Messerly, actually a um, Swiss guy, published in a quite high impact journal. And what you see here is a plot of the chocolate consumption in kilograms per year and capita, and here the number of Nobel laureates. <laughs> um, very nice trend line. Here's Switzerland, Portugal is somewhere here. We have a few outliers, some in this direction, some in the others. So use it wisely. But, well, I'm not here to talk about chocolate and Nobel prizes. I'm actually here to talk about cichlid fishes and more specifically the adaptive radiation of cichlid fishes in East Africa and also a bit about explosive speciation in these systems. And like so many other people in this conference and in evolutionary biology in general, I would like to start with the origin. The origin of species, obviously, but also the origin of the origin of species, which is, of course, Charles Darwin. And here um, you sort of see the cover of his most important book, I should say, and what is always interesting to me is already when looking just at this cover page and where the sort of funds, um, at the funds you see what has been the important question, I guess, to Darwin himself. And it's really the origin of species that is put there in these prominent uh, letters. Well, I think there's a lot of uh, things to like about Charles Darwin. But uh, one thing that I like uh, in particular is that he started out his career as a naturalist with some period of field work, some extensive period of field work in a sense. Um, he was five years, about five years, uh, on this boat, the HMS Spiegel, and this journey literally brought him around the world. He visited a lot of places, mostly in the southern hemisphere, and well, as we all know, there is one place in particular uh, that is sort of imprinted in our collective minds if we talk about Charles Darwin, and this is the Galapagos Archipelago. We also have heard a bit of that already. And, um, well, there's this one group of birds that are really an important example and a textbook example of exactly this process of adaptive radiation, and this is the Darwin's finches. Now, even though these birds might not have been as important to Charles Darwin himself, they really illustrate uh, an adaptive radiation nicely. And an adaptive radiation is um, nothing else than like the origin, the rapid origin of a great deal of morphological and ecological diversity from a common ancestor as a consequence to the adaptation to distinct ecological niches. And of course, this adaptation into niches is really nicely illustrated in the group of these birds when we look at the beaks of these finches, because this is the tool that they use to exploit the different ecological niches. Now, it's exactly these instances of adaptive radiation that allow us to, <coughs> well, have a closer look at some of the key processes in evolution and some of the most interesting questions. And to me, I've always wondered why there is some lineages that have not diversified over long evolutionary time periods, whereas on the other hand, you have these groups of organisms that have diversified rapidly into a great deal of diversity. And now, if we have these groups that are diverse, this is, I think, where we have sort of a zoom into some of the key processes in evolution. <coughs> and to me, this clearly is sort of the process of adaptation. So the adaptation to, for example, a new environment. This is evolutionary innovation, so something new evolving in evolution, a new character. And that's clearly uh, also the process of diversification, or if we put it in another way, it's speciation in the Darwinian sense. And this is also the three processes that we are studying in my lab. More specifically, we also look at the genetic and genomic basis of these processes within a group of fishes that you have heard that is interesting, at least to me, and these are the cichlid fishes. Now, obviously, they are not only interesting uh, to me, so I always like to put this quotation from George Barlow, who basically spent all of his scientific career working with these cichlid fishes. And he said, well, during his entire career as a biologist or naturalist, he has never sort of found any group that wasn't interesting. Even among plants, obviously, there's some, some interesting groups, just in case <laughs> there's botanists around, you know. So there's um, really a lot of interesting groups, but some of the groups stick out as special, and this is where you do find the cichlid fishes. Now, one of the sort of immediate uh, views on cichlids, or if you look at some of them, then you can clearly see why they are interesting, simply because of the diversity that you find in that group. So 
you clearly see that there is differences in coloration, there is differences in body shape, just compare the roundish discus fish to this elongated like uh, Julidochromis from Lake Tanganyika. There's also quite some differences in size, so you have these very tiny little creatures that live in empty shells in Lake Tanganyika compared to quite substantial fishes like the guabote here from Nicaragua, and in, I think in Marta's talk you're going to hear a bit about that. I can just tell you they taste very well, the fishes of that size, so that's one of the advantages of sampling a bit of tissue for DNA work, then you can put the rest on the barbecue. <laughs> now having mentioned uh, Africa, Tanganyika, Nicaragua, I should very briefly tell you where these cichlids occur. And cichlids are what is sort of a convenient group. That means they are distributed on what used to be the landmass of the southern supercontinent Gondwana land. And that sort of makes us to believe that the ancestor of the cichlid fishes lived already sort of <laughs> on this supercontinent and then became distributed with continental drift so that we now find some ancestral lineages relatively species poor in India, Sri Lanka, Madagascar. And then we have these two large radiations, one in Central and South America and the other one in Africa and there especially in East Africa. And that's where we are going now. More specifically, we are going to Lake Tanganyika. This is one of these lakes and this is where we do most of our work. In fact, Tanganyika is one lake of the three Great Lakes in the East African Rift Valley. And these lakes are home to these spectacular species, flocks of cichlid fishes. The lakes are Lake Victoria that you see here with about 500 species, it's an estimated number. Lake Tanganyika with 250 described species and then we have Lake Malawi with an estimated number of about 1,000 species. And now in this illustration you already see that there are similarities between the faunas. I should tell you that um, the cichlid species flocks have different ages, quite uh, different ages so to speak. Lake Tanganyika is the oldest of about 10 million years lake 12 million years, the species flock maybe 10 million years, the lake Malawi species flock is about 1 million year old, <coughs> uh, lake Victoria species flock much younger, and so these are really independent adaptive radiations seeded at different time scales and in large parts from different lineages. But the sort of convergence that we find between these cichlid species flocks um, is even more extreme if you look sort of on the next chart, and this is this also in the meantime, famous uh, example of convergence between two different lakes. So here you see five representatives on the left side of species from Lake Tanganyika, five from Lake Malawi, uh, and they are really very similar. But the thing is that this guy here from Lake Malawi, it's a monophyletic or more or less monophyletic <coughs> species flock, is much more closely related to this guy, to that guy, than to that, uh, to that guy and to that guy than it is to <coughs> any of the Tanganyikan counterparts. So massive degree of convergence. And this convergence, we have in body shape, body morphology, <coughs> coloration, as you see, but we also have to have a closer look into what is called the trophic apparatus, because this is now really the component in cichlid fishes that, just like the beaks of the Darwin's finches, uh, sort of show us, tell us the adaptation to the distinct environments. So here you see different trophic types in cichlid <coughs> fishes. We have insectivorous species that have often tiny little teeth to pick out insects from the ground. We have all kinds of zooplanktifors with pipette-like mouths that suck up sort of uh, plankton. Then uh, we do have all different kinds of algae scrapers. There is uh, f uh, fish eaters or piscivorous species. We have uh, leaf eaters, the leaf eats that fall into the lakes. We have different kinds of mud diggers and mud shovelers. Then we have fin biters that are specialized to eat fins of other cichlid fishes. We have these eye biters that suck out eyes of other cichlid fishes. And there are these scale eaters that exclusively eat scales of other cichlid fishes. So a great deal of adaptation to the distinct um, food types. But we even have to have a closer look um, in here because the cichlids do have another trophic adaptation like other fishes as well. And this, to see this, we have to have a look uh, inside the head and inside um, the trophic apparatus of cichlids because cichlids have a second set of jaws. So you see here the neurocranium, this is where the brain is, and then here are the oral jaws, so like the normal, if you want to uh, call it like that. And then inside the throat, in the pharyngeal area, you have what is called the pharyngeal jaws. This is a modification of the branchial arches. And this is a very effective apparatus to process foods. Here you see a 3D scan. So you have this lower uh, bone, the lower jaw bone, and then several upper jaw bones. 
And all the food that the cichlids eat basically goes through here and they chew with this apparatus. You see it has a lot of teeth and it's a really effective machinery to process the food. And there's a functional decoupling from the oral jaws to the pharyngeal jaws and this sort of decoupling of the um, like eating, catching or whatsoever and processing of the food is thought to be a potential evolutionary key innovation triggering or at least contributing to the adaptive radiations of cichlid fishes. And not only are the heads diverse, and we are now moving from charts to real images, but also these pharyngeal jaws are very diverse between the species. So here you see some with large teeth, that's a mollusk eater, that's an algae scraper with many little fine teeth, and so on and so on. So here is another line basically illustrating that what you saw in charts before in the heads is also continued to the inside of the fishes in these pharyngeal jaw bones. And now I'm coming to uh, sort of the first story that I would like to tell here. And this is sort of an investigation of the species flock of Lake Tanganyika. And what we did was actually to uh, sort of quantify morphology of the body shape, of the pharyngeal jaw shape, so of this inner bone, and uh, sort of analyze it in the framework and in the context of phylogeny, obviously, but also ecology and the method we used was the stable isotope method that we have heard uh, yesterday already about. So the sort of a chemical measurement of two elements, Dn, so the nitrogen, um, and the carbon isotopes that we measure in the muscle tissue so that we can place an individuum but also a species in sort of um, the, eco the eco space, if we call it like that. But the first thing I would like to present you is this wonderful phylogeny of cichlid fishes from Lake Tanganyika because I think to me at least this really sort of illustrates this species explosion where you end up with a lot of different species. And I made it very colorful, not only for the joy of us, but this is some information that is important because this color refer to the different groups. And from now on it's very important for the rest of the talk that you remember all these names that I have put here. <laughs> In fact, it's not important, obviously. But just remember that if you see something that has the same color, then it means that they are closely related genetically. Yeah? Color means belonging to what is called a tribe in cichlid fishes. So the next thing I'm going to show is um, a sort of complex um, illustration. This is basically a shape analysis, so shape similarity of these pharyngeal jaws, of this inner structure. And this is not a tree anymore, this is a cluster analysis, but it's sort of interpretable just like a phylogenetic tree is. Whatever is clustered together in this case is similar, not genetically obviously, but morphologically. And so we find some discrete clusters uh, of shape, and this is just uh, again a zoom in into some examples, but you see here is a group that has very long horns, here is a compact one, these are the algae eaters and so on. But if you now look at the colors that indicate phylogenetic relationships, then you see that we have basically a rainbow plot or something like that. So in this example, clearly we have no connection between morphology and phylogeny. So no connection to phylogeny, what is left, the connection to ecology. And what we do find here is that sort of this morphological similarity is also mirrored in the stable isotopes. I'm only showing the nitrogen isotope here which sort of uh, shows the place in the food chain. But you see the trend, and it's of course statistically very robust, that who is whoever is similar in morphology is sort of similar in ecology within this radiation. But what that also means is that we basically have a lot of convergence in these adaptive radiations, because we do find very sort of closely related species that are very distinct morphologically, and on the other hand, we have very distantly related species, so whenever we have two colors next to each other that are morphologically very similar. Now we set up, or we set out to have a closer look on this sort of um, convergence issue, and we use several methods. I'm just going to introduce you one here that is a conceptually rather simple method to measure convergence, <coughs> because under sort of what we plot here is simply morphological distance against phylogenetic distance. And of course, under standard, neutral, <coughs> evolution, Brownian models and whatever you would expect, that basically the more distant, in terms of phylogeny, two species are, the more distant they are also in terms of morphology. So this is sort of the neutral <coughs> expectation. Well, you might have rapid divergence, that means still closely related but very diverse, but it's still sort of linear. And then there is this corner left, and this corner down here is simply 
a large phylogenetic distance but a very small morphological distance. And this is simply, or this can be under some circumstances, be interpreted as convergent evolution. And what we did now, we used our data set that contained a lot of different species, more than 70, and we did all pairwise comparisons of phylogenetic distance versus con um, morphological distance. We plotted that, but at the same time we modeled that along our phylogeny, exactly under some Brownian motion. And now what you see here in this rather complex thingy, basically you see our models compared to our empirical data. So basically, whenever there is something blue, we do find more data points in the model than in our empirical data. Uh, whenever you see red, then you see many more cases in the empirical data than predicted by any neutral model. And so you basically just need to look at the colors and you see that exactly in this area that is characteristic for convergent evolution, we, ha we are empirical data heavy, so to speak, so we find many more data points than predicted by the model. And this is true for body shape, but this is also true for pharyngeal jaw shape. Now, well, you have all these plots and all these data points, so I think what we need to see is now a real example, and that's this star here that I have here. So this is an example of convergent evolution within an adaptive radiation. And this is these two fish here, and just remember <coughs> all the diversity that I showed you before compared to this. These are really very similar. They are similar to a degree that the local fishermen in East Africa at Lake Tanganyika, which usually are, well, are very able to distinguish <coughs> two species, they pile them together as one species, also because they co-occur. They catch them in the same nets and on the same sort of lines with hooks. Of course there are differences. This has larger scales than this one, but you need to have a closer look. Now, um, this is a species pair, very morphologically similar, but obviously very genetically distinct. Just remember that the colors refer to the different tribes, so I would just like to go back to the phylogeny and show you where these two guys are. So they are really as distinct, more or less, as you can be within the adaptive radiation of cichlids in Lake Tanganyika. So they are obviously very morphologically distinct, not only in body shape, but also in the shape of these pharyngeal jaws. They are basically indistinguishable to us at the jaw level. And the interesting thing I said, they occur sympatrically, but they really also eat the same. So they have specialized to eat on shrimps because we find these pincers of these endemic freshwater shrimps in their stomachs. And that simply means that uh, sort of from two different angles of the phylogenetic uh, tree, so to speak, or from the adaptive radiation at some later stage, really two species converged to fill the same niche, at least in adult space. And this is just one example, so there's really several actually quite a bunch of examples of these convergent species pairs within Lake Tanganyika. Here's just some more examples I just tried to show you, the most illustrative one. So we have this convergence within an adaptive radiation. Now this example, or this study, also shows a very neat thing about the cichlid adaptive radiations in East Africa. Because we have these massive adaptive radiations, we can sort of look at the end products of an adaptive radiation, and we can use that to sort of reconstruct the pathway of the adaptive radiation so we can go back in time reconstructing something. We can do that uh, based on morphology, ecology as I've shown, but of course we use genetic tools so that we can reconstruct the phylogeny, we can look at genes, we can in these genes even sort of identify ancestral states and we can find out a lot of the patterns of evolution that took place. But one thing that we cannot really do in this case, that is to study speciation as such. Because if we want to look at speciation, we actually would like to sort of spot in here exactly at the branches where two or more spin um, lineages diverge and look at what's happening there. So if we go from now on to the past, then we cannot really focus on that. And this continuum the speciation continuum is one thing that is largely, or at least studies on that, missing in cichlid fishes so far. Now we have heard yesterday um, some very interesting talks um, about um, a lot of different uh, <coughs> species, organisms, lineages. Now this is a drawings that Helena did uh, yesterday during the talks and I asked her to bring it to me today because that's sort of a wrap-up of all these different organisms that we had um, heard stories of yesterday. And I really like these drawings, like the bed looks very funny to me. 
So thanks for sharing that uh, piece of artwork with a signature with me. Um, but I would like to point out to one particular species that we heard a lot about yesterday and in which the speci speciation continuum has been studied to, um, well, some detail, if not to say more. And this is, of course, the uh, stickleback case. So this is, I'm not saying much more about that because we had these uh, excellent talks yesterday. But in the, in the sticklebacks, we have this benthic transition. We have the uh, sort of marine freshwater transition always sort of this gradient where you can study what is going on. And we have this, um, this is um, in part and also work that I have contributed a bit. We have this lake stream sticklebacks even in Switzerland. That's why this flag is there. And um, sort of these ongoing events, this is something where you can really study speciation while it occurs. And so far, as I said, that has been missing a bit in cichlids, but I would like to show you a case now where we believe we have such a case. Um, and this is the case of Astata dodilapia bordoni, which has quite some similarities even to the stickleback because it's a fish species that has been used for decades uh, for behavioral studies. You will hear more about that species a bit later. That has been used in all other studies as a fish model. And the genome is sequenced, which is a great <laughs> advantage whenever you do something further. Now, uh, even though this is work under progress, I would like to convince you with the next few slides that we really have uh, sort of the possibility to look at this continuum in a parallel setting, just as we have it in, um, in the stickleback fish. And so I said um, that uh, stickleback <coughs> fish are very cool, but I think cichlids are cooler because now we even have the speciation continuum. Felicity. That was a good way to put it, okay. So what we did is we collected a lot of samples of this species in southern Lake Tanganyika. So more than a thousand. You see the area that's quite a large area, but you see on the map already that we sampled within the lake and within rivers. And this is really the unique thing, that this is one of the rare species that really do occur within the lake and in rivers as well. All other species, or most other species, are really either part of the riverine fauna adapted to that or are part of these massive adaptive radiations. This is sort of both. Now, um, when you do a structure plot, you see that there is quite some genetic structure in there. So this is based on some microsatellites, but we have rat data now as well. This is just to illustrate that there is something going on. I would like to now just zoom into four of these lake stream systems that we have had a look in more detail. Now the first one is the Lufubo River that is here in this area. And you see that this is one kilometer, so that's a quite a large river, quite a substantial river, so to speak. And it really has a very riverine environment, habitat <coughs> upstream here, and then more lake habitats at the estuary or downstream. Then um, there is another nice river, and that's the Lunsua that is in this area. So the distance here is it's a few kilometers, but the upstream habitat is really riverine. I mean, this is really a riverine habitat with a waterfall. <coughs> this is sort of the lake habitat where the lake population comes from. Um, we also have a very small river. That's the Chidili River. That's really a creek where you can jump easily from one end to the other. So um, you see the distance just three or 400 meters between the sampling sites. And then we have finally this river here. That's the Calambo River that we have studied in most detail because it's close to our field site where we have such typically riverine habitats where these fish occur, intermediate one and lake habitats. And most importantly to us also, there is this 220 meter waterfall that separates one population from the rest. So now let's have a look at um, the genetics data that we find now within the river systems. And just as we are, we've seen from the stickleback case, we have some instances where we, are clearly we have clearly distinct populations. So this is three clusters according to sort of also this massive barrier here with the waterfall. Then the riverine one is separated from the downstream one. We have this river where we have a much less strong structure, so to speak. This is this tiny little river. And in the other rivers, we also have sort of this separation in part with some gene flow between populations like here. These two <coughs> are sort of together. Now, I'm not going into the detail of all analysis that we have done, but I would just like to take out the Calambo system to show you the differences between the populations in some morphological aspects. This is a discriminant function analysis between two um, of the uh, populations based on these morphological landmarks. And what you see is there's basically no overlap between the downstream and upstream populations in terms of morphology. 
Um, if you plot these uh, four populations in the canonical <coughs> variance, uh, variate analysis, then you see that the populations are also morphologically clearly distinct. And just remember that these three are in principle connected, so fish can swim along. Um, so there is some overlap, except this one, the most riverine one, is separated. And here I'm just, or we ju uh, just showing what are the morphological changes between the populations or the main axis. And it's interesting that we clearly have this change in the mouth position and body height. <coughs> so the, the river fish are always more streamlined and have a different eye size and, and um, sort of mouth position. And that is also true, of course, for the pharyngeal jaws. So if you look inside the fish again, and this is always important in cichlids to also um, look at this part, you see that in this uh, pharyngeal jaws, even within the river systems, um, these fish are uh, morphologically separated, clearly separated, even more separated, uh, it seems, than based on body shape. And finally, we also did, uh, we looked in some literature of the of the sticklebacks, so we also measured gill rakers. Actually, that's the residuals of gill raker length. We plotted males and females separately because uh, they are slightly different. You will see later why that is. That has to do with the breeding behavior. But again, uh, river populations are clearly distinct in all systems from um, river populations. <coughs> so what we have here, I think, <coughs> is um, a setting that at least reminds me to the different sort of stories we heard of stickleback systems with the advantage that it's um, sort of within an adaptively radiating clade that has hundreds of species. So this is just summarizing that and showing the same data for the other river systems. And I told you work is in progress, but it um, looks quite interesting to us. And it makes a lot of sense that the smallest one, which is genetically closest, is also morphologically closest. So we have this gradient, we have these parallel settings, and we are looking now into the genomic data here to hopefully also un understand in cichlids what is going on and to find some of the genes. Now, the last story I would like to tell you <coughs> still has to do with uh, the same fish species. <coughs> simply because I said it's an important model species in um, all kinds of studies with cichlids. But we use it as a model for the breeding mode that uh, cichlids sort of evolved in East Africa. And it's a rather complex system where several different factors play together and where a spe specific morphological trait plays an important role. So phylogenetically, many of these, actually most of these East African cichlid fishes belong to what is called the haplochromine cichlids. In fact, all the species from Lake Victoria and of Lake Malawi belong to these haplochromines. And there is not that many morphological features that distinguish them from the, um, from the other more ancestral cichlid lineages. Uh, but there is one trait in particular that the haplochromines have, and these are yellow to orange to reddish spots on the anal fin of the males. So here you see a male of this Astato de Lapia Bordoni that I showed you before. And this is now pictures from the same populations that we have studied for the lake stream, where you see different spots, different spot patterns on the anal fin. And this is part of the special breeding behavior of this fish. Because this fish, all these haplochromans are female mouth brooders. That means the females carries the babies in the mouth, and you see that here. This is the mother, and here is the eye of the little baby inside of her mouth. This is a very protective way of breeding, um, but it's also a rather complex one. And what's happening under normal circumstances is that a female, if she's gravid, she lays some eggs. Of course, she has to be attracted by the male, and there's some dancing and showing off of colors and so on involved. But then the female lays her eggs she immediately turns around and picks up her eggs in the mouth. And this is most likely an adaptation to predation pressure because cichlid caviar is not only tasty for us, but also for all the other cichlid fishes. But if the female takes up the eggs in her mouth immediately, there is something missing, uh, something important missing, I guess, in biology, and that's fertilization. And this is when these egg spots or egg dummies come into the game. Because the male then would present these dummies to the female and the female reacts to them and picks on these dummy eggs pretty much as if she would like to pick up her own eggs. And in this moment, it's on the anal fin, the male releases sperm and uh, the eggs get fertilized within the female's mouth. That's mouth brooding. And to prove that, I have a little very old fish porn movie for you that shows this whole thing. <laughs> Um, so this is uh, the breeding cycle, now a really old movie from, uh, from the 60s or 70s. 
but I like it a, a lot because it shows everything. Here we have the male with these spots and here we have the female approaching. And now you see here the female, she's going to come to the front. Now it makes sort of plop underwater. Here are the eggs. She turns around, takes them up. He does nothing at this stage. But then he sta starts presenting these egg spots and the female uh, sort of reacts to those, tries to pick them up, fertilization takes place and then she has the babies for about two to three weeks in her mouth. Now we had several questions when we started out um, like looking at these egg spots and one is of course what could drive the evolution of these spots. So we had a closer look at the phylogeny and there's sort of an interesting pattern because this is the derived clade of what we call the modern haplochromines which have these nice egg dummies, egg spots on the anal fin and they evolved from the phylogenetically older Lake Tanganyika mouth brooders. Th these are also mouth brooders but they don't have egg spots. Now the interesting thing is that there is a lineage in between uh, that is a haplochromine but doesn't have experts and this has also a wonderful name, it's called Pseudocrinilabrus multicolor, so a wonderful name for a cichlid fish, al almost a hippie name. But in any case it doesn't have an expert. It has this orange uh, reddish pattern here but no real nice spot that resembles an egg. So we thought maybe we could ask uh, the females of these fish whether they like egg spots or not. And you can do that with a really fancy method. This method is called Photoshop. Basically, you just take the same image and you paste a little expert on the anal fin. And then we just presented it to the females and we asked the female which of these two images she liked uh, better. So they are identical, except for this tiny little spot here, which is basically the image of an egg of that species, a little bit modified, but so to match the colors. And we did that by placing an iMac computer behind an aquarium. And here is the proof of principle. Different species, that's our Bordoni, that's their own species. So we calibrated the whole thing and checked if it really worked. And the females would like her own male dancing a bit, uh, hanging around with the guy. So this showed us, well, okay, that the method works. And this is now the real experiment where one fish has a spot, the other one not. Of course, there were lots of controls involved. And we measured different parameters. And uh, funny enough, in basically, actually in all the parameters we measured, um, we find that the females really prefer the ones with this tiny little modification. So they spend more time with uh, this uh, fish, they show more reactions, um, also longer reaction time and things like that. And this to us shows that there must have been already a female preference for the spot somehow before the spot evolved. But this is within the mouth brooders, so we also wanted to go phylogenetically further away. Now this we couldn't do in the lab, we had to go to Africa, we had to go to Africa <laughs> to our field site uh, where we have such ponds that we can use. Um, and what we did is we tested a whole bunch of species, now here we don't have electric power and we cannot sync iPhone computers, at least not at the moment in these ponds. So we, do, we did it a bit more less controlled I should say, but um, African style, so we made these little spots and presented these to um, all different species to estimate if they have color preferences for spots. So we basically measured then in a pool of species uh, which spots, uh, of which color they preferred, of course with some controls as well. And the interesting thing is basically that if you walk along the phylogeny, red and orange colors are dominating as a preference. And this preference is much older than the group of the uh, mouth brooders. So even all the others, the substrate spawners, also like spots of that color. And you can test that if you go to a cichlid tank, uh, just put a laser pointer inside, they get crazy for these spots. Why? Because we think they resemble high quality food with carotenoids and so on. So this is what they go for. And this preference, this pre-existing bias has been exploited by the males, that's what we think, to evolve these experts. <coughs> now at the beginning I said we're actually interested in the genetics and how that works. So we also did a lot of other things with those experts. We followed development, for example, because these experts are not there at birth. When the fish are babies, they don't have these spots. These spots only emerge when males become sexually mature, so you have this cloud of pigment cells that then forms to make egg spots, this is Bordoni again, so when they are then becoming real territorial males, you have this nice pigment pattern. 
Um, but you can make use of this series, of this developmental series, because this can be used to study the genetics. You can use candidate genes that we did for a while, but then the real improvement came with uh, RNA sequencing based on Illumina. Now this chart just illustrates what you would expect, in fact, if you do such an RNA sequencing experiment. Not all these dots are real data because the real data cloud consists of 49,000 dots because that's our reference transcriptome. We would get lost. I'm just trying to explain the principle here. Um, this is an example for, uh, where you take a male fin with X spots and compare it to the female fin. Now, if uh, a transcript is... Exp so you basically use Illumina to sequence <coughs> every piece of mRNA that is in there in the uh, pool, and you compare the different pools with several replicates and things like that. Now, what you expect is, of course, that most genes, because they are equally expressed between males and females, would lie along this sort of line. And then you have a buff on this corner, genes that are overexpressed in males, and here, um, basically, genes that are overexpressed in females. Now, three of these data points are, in fact, real because they show real genes. And this would be uh, a transcription factor, a known candidate gene, so to speak. But there is no difference in expression between females and males. It really lies about uh, this line. Here's a gene that is overexpressed in females, but we are interested in the X spots. So we are interested in what is there in the male. And this is this red gene here that's an androgen receptor cofactor. That was the gene that we found to be massively overexpressed in males, but also in exports. So this became our main candidate. And androgen receptor makes a lot of sense if you have a male trait, at least by name. So what Emilia did then, who did all these experiments as well, uh, she tried to, or she confirmed all these results by quantitative PCR with many more individuals, with many more species. So basically, if you take a female fin and a male fin and you do quantitative PCR, you get exactly the same amount of overexpression on average that you get with uh, RNA sequencing. So we recently had a talk in Basel. Uh, they also had the same th uh, finding. They said, we are not going to do qPCR on anymore. We only do RNA sec. It's much more detailed. And that's really true. But what we can do with the qPCR, we can go more in detail because in principle you could have sort of just a male-female thing, not the spot thing. So this is now within the males, cut out spots compared to the re remaining tissue. We always find this androgen receptor overexpressed. Now here comes the advantage of having a genome or having actually several genomes because we have five cyclic genomes. So we can look in these genomes and look at the region of the gene. And what I'm showing here is what is called vista plots. That is simply an alignment on a pairwise basis between different species. Our reference species here is again our Astatodilapia bordoni, where we look at the genetic region around this uh, gene that is about 20 kb of the genome. Everything in, in purple um, is the exons of this androgen receptor cofactor. Everything in pink is the non-coding area around. And we compare this Bordoni with other three uh, cichlid species. And what is shown is similarity plots between 50 and 100% in that genomic region. And what you see, well, cichlids are closely related. You basically have high similarities, always around 95 to 100%. Not always, though, because in some areas, that's black. And black, in this case, means there is something missing, or it's basically a present absence. So it's present in this one and the reference, but not in those. Now let's have a look to those who have the exports. Well, interestingly enough, the <coughs> ones that have exports have something more. And this something more is the insertion of a transposable element right in the upstream region of that gene that uh, we believe is our export gene. And now what you want to do, of course, this is correlational. We confirmed that not only in these five genomes, but in basically a lot of cichlid species, and those ones that have exports have these insertions, those that don't, don't have this insertion. What you would like to do is, of course, to make, this is all correlational now, what you would like to do is basically go transgenics, take this sort of upstream region in front of that uh, androgen receptor cofactor, cut that cofactor away and replace it by a GFB, this green fluorescence protein, and then basically put it back and see what it does. Now, here is the problem that we have with cichlids. This mouth brooding, which includes also small numbers and, well, all these behavioral processes don't really permit us at the moment to do transgenics um, with cichlid. So what we have to do is to use the most boring of all fishes, the so-called zebra fish. <laughs> and we basically tried to incorporate the cichlid DNA into the zebra fish. And because it worked, it's not the most boring fish anymore, I should say. <laughs> In any case. 
the idea would be we take this cichlid upstream DNA with this transposable element and the promoter. So this is cichlid specific DNA that doesn't exist in zebrafish. We link it to GFB, we put it into zebrafish, and if in zebrafish there is a genetic network that is, is responsible to that, let's say that there's transcription factors that would sort of interact with that and bind with that, then we would have the green signal made by the cichlid specific promoter region within the zebrafish. And so we did some of these injections. This is a zebrafish embryo, there's some colors. This is not so important. That is the larval stage in green, that is in red, that the experiment worked. But remember, um, exports is an adult trait. So we have to look in the adult fin. And when we look in the adult fin and zoom into that, then funnily enough, we really find a little spot pattern with that cichlid specific DNA in zebrafish. So don't take me wrong, I'm not saying we made a uh, zebrafish with cichlid X spots, but we can show with this experiment that this upstream region of the gene is responsive to some transcription factors in zebrafish, but also exactly in the area where we would actually uh, predict that it would work in this fin race, and it makes some pattern even that could be sort of the starting point for the co-option um, of the genetic network by, or to in the end, build experts. <coughs> Good, this was my stories for today. I would like to finish again with an image that shows the diversity of cichlid fishes here of Lake Tanganyika, and I have a few take-home messages that refer to the three processes that I have mentioned at the beginning. So, um, one has to do with adaptation, and this is, remember, the example of the lake stream um, cichlid pair that we are actually studying now in detail that we think has the potential um, to really focus on speciation while it's ongoing in an adaptive radiation of cichlid fishes. The other thing has to do with innovation, so we believe that the innovation uh, of this export, the evolutionary innovation of this making or building up this new trade was triggered by the insertion of a transposable element in the upstream region and the behavioral mm -hmm. trigger was this uh, pre-existing bias of females. And at the beginning I have uh, been telling you a story about convergence within an adaptive radiation of cichlid <coughs> fishes, not between lakes, but within the lakes. And I think this is um, maybe one uh, idea why sort of there are so many cichlid fishes, which is still an open question because if they share environments, if they share niches, however you define it, but this is basically or could be one way how they multiply species numbers by basically coexisting in the same environment. And with this, um, I would like to thank, of course, the people of my lab. Here is from the picture from our Christmas uh, party this year. You find the information about our work on Facebook or um, at our university's uh, webpage and also the literature you've seen that there were the references inside and of course I would like to um, thank all the funding, funding agencies that support our work um, and you for your attention and I would like to close with that mask from the Congo at the coastline of Lake Tanganyika. Thank you very much for your attention. I think there's a lot of uh, things to like about Charles Darwin, but uh, one thing that I like uh, in particular is that he started out his career as a naturalist with some period of field work, some extensive period of field work in a sense. Um, he was five years, about five years, uh, on this boat, the HMS Beagle, and this journey literally brought him around the world. He visited a lot of places, mostly in the southern hemisphere, and well, as we all know, there's one place in particular uh, that is sort of imprinted in our collective minds if we talk about Charles Darwin, and this is the Galapagos Archipelago. We also have heard a bit of that already. And, um, well, there's this one group of birds that are really an important example and a textbook example of exactly this process of adaptive radiation, and this is the Darwin's finches. Now, even though these birds might not have been as important to Charles Darwin himself, they really illustrate uh, an adaptive radiation nicely. And an adaptive radiation is um, nothing else than like the origin, the rapid origin of a great deal of morphological and ecological diversity from a common ancestor as a consequence to the adaptation to distinct ecological niches. And of course this adaptation into niches is really nicely illustrated in the group of these birds when we look at the beaks of these finches because this is the tool that they use to exploit the different ecological niches. 
Now, it's exactly these instances of adaptive radiation that allow us to <coughs> well, have a closer look at some of the key processes in evolution and some of the most interesting questions in terms are Lake Victoria that you see here with about 500 species, it's an estimated number. Lake Tanganyika with 250 described species and then we have Lake Malawi with an estimated number of about 1,000 species. And now in this illustration you already see that there are similarities between the faunas. I should tell you that um, the cichlid species flocks have different ages, quite uh, different ages so to speak. Lake Tanganyika is the oldest of about 10 million years. Lake 12 million years, the species flock maybe 10 million years. The Lake Malawi species flock is about 1 million year old. Uh, Lake Victoria species flock much younger. And so these are really independent adaptive radiation seeded at different time scales and in large parts from different lineages. But the sort of convergence that we find between these cichlid species flocks um, is even more extreme if you look sort of on the next chart. And this is this also in the meantime, famous uh, example of convergence between two different lakes. So here you see five representatives on the left side of species from Lake Tanganyika, five from Lake Malawi, uh, and they are really very similar. But the thing is that this guy here from Lake Malawi, it's a monophyletic or more or less monophyletic species flock, is much more closely related to this guy, to that guy, than to that, to that guy and to that guy than it is to <coughs> any of the Tanganyikan counterparts. So massive degree of convergence. And this convergence, we have in body shape, body morphology, <coughs> coloration, as you see, but we also have to have a closer look into what is called the trophic apparatus, because this is now really the component. Me, I've always wondered why there is some lineages that have not diversified over long evolutionary time periods, whereas on the other hand, you have these groups of organisms that have diversified rapidly into a great deal of diversity. And now if we have these groups that are diverse, this is, I think, where we have sort of a zoom into some of the key processes in evolution. <coughs> and to me, this clearly is sort of the process of adaptation. So the adaptation to, for example, a new environment. This is evolutionary innovation, so something new evolving in evolution, a new character. And that's clearly uh, also the process of diversification, or if we put it in another way, it's speciation in a Darwinian sense. And this is also the three processes that we are studying in my lab. More specifically, we also look at the genetic and genomic basis of these processes within a group of fishes that you have heard that is interesting, at least to me, and these are the cichlid fishes. Now, obviously, they are not only interesting uh, to me, so I always like to put this quotation from George Barlow, who basically spent all of his scientific career working with these cichlid fishes, and he said, well, during his entire career as a biologist or naturalist, he has never sort of found any group that wasn't interesting, even among plants, obviously, there is some, some interesting groups, just in case <laughs> there's botanists around, you know. So there's um, really a lot of interesting groups, but some of the groups stick out as special, and this is where you do find the cichlid fishes. Now, one of the sort of immediate uh, views on cichlids, or if you look at some of them, then you can clearly see why they are in. Being from Switzerland, I have to bring some Swiss <laughs> chocolate, so I pass it on to you. <laughs> Enjoy it. But you know, um, use it wisely. Um, maybe... Um, Maybe you have seen recently this sort of charts that have been around. That's an interesting sort of survey that has been done by Mr. Messerly, actually a um, Swiss guy, published in a quite high impact journal. And what you see here is a plot of the chocolate consumption in kilograms per year and capita, and here the number of Nobel laureates. Um, very nice trend line. Here's Switzerland, Portugal is somewhere here. We have a few outliers, some in this direction, some in the others. So use it wisely, but, well, I'm not here to talk about chocolate and Nobel Prizes. I'm actually here to talk about cichlid fishes and more specifically the adaptive radiation of cichlid fishes in East Africa and also a bit about explosive speciation in these systems. And like so many other people in this conference and in evolutionary biology in general, I would like to start with the origin. The origin of species, obviously, but also the origin of the origin of species, which is, of course, Charles Darwin. And here um, you sort of see the cover of his most important book, I should say. 
And what is always interesting to me is already when looking just at this cover page and where the sort of funds, um, at the funds you see what has been the important question, I guess, to Darwin himself, and it's really the origin of species that is put there in these prominent uh, letters. Well, interesting, simply because of the diversity that you find in that group. So you clearly see that there is differences in coloration, there is differences in body shape, just compared a roundish discus fish to this elongated, like uh, Julidochromis from Lake Tanganyika. There's also quite some differences in size, so you have these very tiny little creatures that live in empty shells in Lake Tanganyika compared to quite substantial fishes like the Guabote here from Nicaragua, and in, I think in Marta's talk you're gonna hear a bit about that. I can just tell you they taste very well, the fishes of that size. So that's one of the advantage of sampling a bit of tissue for DNA work, then you can put the rest on the barbecue. <laughs> now having mentioned uh, Africa, Tanganyika, Nicaragua, I should very briefly tell you where these cichlids occur. And cichlids are what is sort of a convenient group that means they are distributed on what used to be the landmass of the southern supercontinent Gondwana land. And that sort of makes us to believe that the ancestor of the cichlid fishes lived already sort of <laughs> on this supercontinent and then became distributed with continental drift so that we now find some ancestral lineages relatively species poor in India, Sri Lanka, Madagascar. And then we have these two large radiations, one in Central and South America, and the other one in Africa, and there especially in East Africa. And that's where we are going now. More specifically, we are going to Lake Tanganyika. This is one of these lakes, and this is where we do most of our work. In fact, Tanganyika is one lake of the three Great Lakes in the East African Rift Valley. And these lakes are home to these spectacular species, flocks of cichlid fishes. The lakes